Hey friends, my name is Yi and welcome back to a new video for IGCC Geography and today we have a new video for theme 3 which we look into 3.2 for production. So here are the specifications from the website and in this video we have two case studies which are a farm or agricultural system and a country or region suffering from food shortages. So we'll first look at agricultural systems. So basically it's similar to the hydrological cycle that we saw in the previous few videos in theme 2 where there's an input, process and output. So here is some here are some notes. So a quick note is that farming is basically like um like a system where as I mentioned there are inputs, processes, outputs where inputs include labor, machinery, land, fertilizer and seeds which are basically what a farm needs and processes. So inputs are needed so that processes such as plowing or sowing or harvesting can be carried out because the labor from the input of the farm is needed to carry out the processes. And for the output, the aim of the farm is basically to maximize the output, like for example to maximize the yield or maximize the, uh, maximize the crop production. And there are many types of farms, but examples of outputs would be milk, eggs and crops as I mentioned. So moving on to the types of farming, for example arable, pastoral and mixed farming. So arable farms are the cultivation of crops and there is no involvement with livestock. So arable farm basically means uh, just like normal crops, like normal farming that you would think of. Whereas pastoral farms, they raise livestock. So the, the middle of that or the, the combination of that would be mixed farming where it's basically the cultivate, cultivating crops and keeping livestock together on the farm. So here are some notes on the farming. An arable farm may be monocultured. So it just means that it'll grow one crop. For example, just grow um, wheat or a certain type of flour or seeds or whatever. Or it could be polycultured, which is the opposite of monocultured. And market price of the crops might affect whether an arable farm is monoculture or polyculture. And that relates to the economics of the of the plants and how well they can sell and the demand. And usually on a mixed farm, at least a part of the harvested crop is used to feed the livestock, just like a cycle. So for example, if a farm grows uh, wheat as well as grass, part of the grass can be used to feed um, the livestock, for example, cattle in the farm, in the mixed farm. And then we have subsistence and commercial farming and the difference between them. So subsistence farming is the most basic form of agriculture where, produce is, where the produce is consumed entirely or mainly by the family that works the land or tends the livestock. And the opposite of that is commercial farming, where it's basically farming for profit. So a summary is that subsistence farming is more, more small scale, more local scale, whereas commercial farming is for farming for profit, like a large scale. And subsistence farming is quite common in rural areas because farmers grow food crops to meet their own needs and their own family needs and they're not doing it for profit and they, need to, they just need the food for themselves so that's subsistence farming. Whereas, the aim, whereas commercial farming is more common in urban areas and the aim of commercial farming is to maximize the yield to achieve the highest profit. This means that they are high density farms which we'll look into it later. And now we'll look at extensive and intensive farming. So extensive farming is where a relatively small amount of agricultural produce is obtained per hectare of land. So this relates to uh, whether the land is de high density or low density, as seen in the previous slide down here. Whereas intensive farming is the agriculture characterized by high inputs per unit of land to achieve high yields per hectare. So from this, we can, uh, it, it can be inferred that uh, extensive farming is low density, whereas intensive farming is high density, like so. And here are some more notes. So extensive farming is when inputs per unit of land are low, so the farm has a large area, which basically means it's low density. And it's often associated with subsistence farming because subsistence farming doesn't need a high density farm as shown in the previous slide. Whereas intensive farming is the opposite 
where the inputs per unit of land are high, so the farm typically has a small area and it's often commercial farming. So what I mean by inputs of land is a, a low or high is that imagine you have this piece of land for, for farming, right? If the inputs for those land could be uh, the seeds, right? so the seeds, as well as, for example, fertilizer, right? Fertilizer, fertilizer. So if it's subsistence farming or let's say extensive farming where the inputs of land are low, this means that there may be less, there will be less seeds and less fertilizer per unit of land. This means that the yield per, per hectare of land won't be as high. But intensive farming, it's trying to maximize the yield and maximize the crop production. So there'll be a high density down here. And now we'll look at organic farming. So in organic farming, instead of these chemicals, uh, the farms use animal and green manures along with mineral fertilizers as a source of fertilizer. And organic farming requires a high label input because these um, organic stuff are needed, are like, they need human or human labor to like spread around the area. But the, the, the good thing about organic farming is that it will reduce the harmful effects of the environment because it's not using harmful chemicals. But because of the high input and the high labor costs involved in the whole process, this means that organic, for, uh, organic crops or organic produce tend to have a higher price than the mainstream farm produce. Then we have factors affecting agricultural land use. So there are physical factors, economic factors, and social, cultural, and political factors. So physical include the landscape, where mountainous areas need um, basically mountainous areas need terrace to be able to grow crops. Temperature, because certain crops need certain temperatures to grow. Soil fertility, because as we know that if the soil is very fertile, this means that less fertilizers are required, and the land can be used to grow crops quite easily. And for water, irrigation is important as the crops need to stay hydrated to improve crop growth and quality. For economic factors, transport, market, capital, and demand are important factors to consider. And also the price of crops may vary from year to year or from season to season due to supply and demand. And agricultural technology is the application of the techniques to control the growth and harvesting of animal and veg uh, vegetable products. And farms are basically becoming increasingly mechanized and human labor is replaced. And then we have social and cultural and political factors as mentioned. For example, uh, the land tenure refers to the way in which the land, is, the, the land is or can be owned. And this basically affects who can use what resources and for how long. And also discrimination in the area or in the region can lead, uh, will lead to unequal access of the land. And there may be some government farm policies which may affect the farmers. And here we have a case study which will look at a farm or agricultural system and we'll look at the lower Ganges Valley which is a place that has intensive rice production. So here's the background of the area. The Ganges is a river that flows through India and Bangladesh and this river is split into the lower Ganges and the middle Ganges. And the lower Ganges plains are more verdant than the middle Ganges plain and as uh, the location here. The lower Ganges Valley is located in India and Bangladesh. And also, rice is 75% of the people's diet. So I just missed a word here. People's diet. Living at the lower Ganges Delta Plains in Bangladesh. So here are the inputs for the, to the farm. The lower Ganges Valley and Delta regions are very suitable for rice cultivation due to lots of diff uh, different physical factors. For example, there's good temperature where it's around 21 degrees Celsius. And there's plenty of water because monsoon rainfall in that region brings over 2,000 millimeters of rainfall. And this is actually necessary for wet rice cultivation. And as rice needs a season of around 100 days, there are two crop seasons each year which will maximize output. And uh, as mentioned from just now, the monsoon season, it'll bring regular flooding which will build up rich alluvial soil to improve soil fertility as well as bringing sufficient water to the rice farm. And as mentioned before, machinery is being increasingly used, which will replace human labor. And then we'll look at the processes. And as the crops are grown in small plots of land in the lower Ganges Valley, the laborers employ intensive farming, 
where there's a lot of input per hectare of land, leading to a labor-intensive process. And manual labor in, uh, in the processes are needed for weeding, planting, irrigation, and harvesting. And also a high labor input in the processes is needed to build embankments and surround the field to stabilize tree crops, such as banana that is grown in the lower Ganges Valley. And also irrigation needs to be, uh, irrigation canals need to be dug in order to, to supply water to the crops. And also manual labor is also needed to cultivate other crops in the dry season and possibly tend livestock if the farm is a mixed farm. And the outputs in those farms include rice, animals or livestock, and the profit from selling the rice. And we also have to consider about the wastage that's, uh, that's coming from the farm. And there may be some wastage through the process, for example, through um, excess fertilizer or different waste from the farms, for example, from the livestock or from the crops that are basically spoiled. And here are some notes. During the dry season, because rice needs lots of water, this means that they can't grow during dry season. This means that cereal is planted instead. So moving on to food shortages. So food shortages can occur due to both natural and human problems, where natural include uh, so loss of soil fertility, natural disasters or disease, or whereas human causes include low capital investment, war and poor infrastructure. And here are the effects. The effects of food shortages could be or include malnutrition, which, uh, which have affected a lot of people in a short period of time when food supplies are reduced. And because of malnutrition, people become weaker and might contract diseases such as beriberi and this disease right here. For example, in Eswatini or Swaziland, the HIV epidemic led to farms and fields left unattended as the farmers contract those diseases, which means that no food was being grown and that caused malnutrition. And the solution to those effects include food aid, and it is vital in that scenario. And this charity called Action Aid suggested there are three types of food aid. There's a relief food aid, program food aid, and project food aid, which you can have, have a research about these and, and like basically use those in your answers. However, there's been controversies in food aids. GMOs, or genetically modified organisms, even though it's said that, the, that those GMOs are not allowed for human consumption, they were found in food aid in West Africa, and it's quite controversial. And also, food aids are quite expensive to set up and operate, so perhaps government intervention is needed in those scenarios. Then we'll look at the Green Revolution. And the Green Revolution is the development of high-yielding varieties of seeds and modern agricultural techniques in developing countries. And it was basically a period where crop yields and agricultural production increased. And the advantage and disadvantage for green revolution include, right down here, the yields are better because there are more crops being grown, the local infrastructure has improved, and there are more jobs as employment has been created in those farms. However, the disadvantage could be there is a high input of fertilizer and pesticide that are required in those farms, where it will perhaps cause environmental pollution because those are chemicals, unless they use organic farming. And also there's mechanization, which means that they replace human labor, which increase rural unemployment. And there's also been an increase in salinization in soil, meaning the soil has become more saline or salty, basically. Then we have another case study, which is a country or region suffering from food shortages, which will look at Isartini or Swaziland. So here's the background of the country. Eswatini or Swaziland is a landlocked country bordering South Africa and Mozambique, and it is one of the best water countries in Southern Africa. And as of 2021, there's a population of around 1.2 million uh, population. And here are the causes of uh, food shortages in Eswatini. There's drought. Because Eswatini is very uh, well watered and, and uh, it's one of the best watered countries in South Africa, and despite of it being uh, of it being a well a very well watered country, there's El Nino or the warming of the ocean surface that will that cause a lack of rainfall in the region, which means crops can't be grown. And this is seen right here. Some statistics: 
where there are deaths of cattle and job in production of maize, as well as affecting students and teachers both in rural and urban areas. And poverty. Almost about 60% of the population lived below the national poverty line in 2017, although it declined since 2009. And due to poverty, this also caused unemployment and inequality. And also over-dependence on imports. Iswatini, because it's a landlocked country, it's highly dependent on imports, but the country has poor infrastructure. And also national production is affected by the aforementioned causes, these right here, as well as natural disasters such as erratic rainfall and poor technology. And then we have the effects of food shortages on the population and on the economy. So as mentioned before, there's malnutrition, where a quarter of children suffer from malnutrition as seen in um, this region right here where 22.5% of the children are malnourished in 2019. And then on the economy, because there's uh, food shortages, this means that the food prices rise as a result due to high demand and low supply. And this relates to the price, demand and supply. And other costs has also increased, which means that the farmers become less able to afford fertilizers for farming, leading to economic decline. So it's, it's a cycle because um, the cost increase like the, um, the fertilizer cost increase, this means that less farmers are able to grow, this means that there's less food, so there's lower supply, but the, demands, uh, the demand stays the same or it increases, which means that the food prices increase. And also, there's also a reliance on food aid due to uh, food shortages, and people in East Latini have been relying on food aid, and up to two-thirds of East Latini's population rely on food aid. And here are some solutions to the food shortages in Iswatini. There's food aid, where the UN distributes food such as maize to Iswatini to support them in times of food shortages. And there's also investment in farming technologies, and this can include investment in irrigation canals and fertilizers to Iswatini, so that people there, people in Iswatini can grow crops and grow food. And the government could also subsidize fertilizer and seeds to the farmers which means that they won't need to purchase it or have to purchase it in a very low price because there's government subsidies. And also education and training, where the veterinary and the farmer training center at this town right here in Iswatini has residential training course for farmers, which trains them so they are able to better equip to face any challenge. And in this course, as I mentioned earlier, they also learn about ways to care for livestock. And that's it for this video. And that's it for this video for 3.2 for food production. And I hope you all find it useful. And if you need any more learning resources or any teaching resources, you can check out my website in the description or you can type it out in your browser at www.gmailseeasy.com. And I hope you all enjoyed this video. And I'll see you all in the next video for a new video for theme 3 for IGCSE Geography. Here's to learning made easy.